Hi everyone, it's Dr. Moby Motion. Today we're going to dive straight into a tutorial on the Flip Fluids add-on for Blender. We're going to cover every important setting, including inflows, which add water to your scene, obstacles, removing water from your scene, white water and vector blur, which are a bit advanced, but add a nice level of realism. And the aim is that this is the only tutorial you need to get started with the Flip Fluids add-on. Feel free to jump around using the chapters down below or in the description and download the finished blend file on Patreon for just $3. Let's get started. Now, first things first, you need to make sure you have the Flip Fluids add-on. If you don't have it, I'll have a link to a free demo down in the description, which you can use to try it out. It just adds a little watermark to the scenes that you make. If you'd like to buy it and you haven't already, feel free to use the affiliate link in the description. That supports my channel and it also supports the great developers behind the project. Once you've uh, downloaded it, you can install it like any other plugin, going into preferences, add-ons and install. And then make sure it's ticked to make sure that it's enabled. And when you first download this, I think there's a button that says like complete installation. Uh, and click that and you'll be ready to go. So next step is to make our scene. We're gonna keep the default cube, but we'll delete the lamp. And you can see all my key presses and all my mouse presses in the bottom left. And we're gonna use this default cube to make our domain. This is gonna hold all of our fluid. So for good practice, let's call it domain. And I'm gonna call it flip fluids or FF domain. This makes things easier to keep track of once you've got a lot of objects in your scene. And we're gonna scale it inside edit mode. This makes sure we don't mess up the scale of the cube object. So we'll tab to go into edit mode. We'll scale it three times in every axis and press enter or return to accept that. And we're gonna scale it in the X axis just a little bit. Actually, I think scaling it two in the axis gives us some nice proportions. Now we'll press tab to go back into edit mode. And we don't wanna see this cube while we're working because everything's gonna be inside it. And we don't want it to block uh, the view of what's inside. For this, we're gonna use the Flip Fluids add-on. It handles all of this stuff for you automatically and you'll see what I mean. So we'll go into the physics tab, we'll click on flip fluids, and for type, we're gonna select domain. So enabling flip fluids tells Blender that we wanna use flip fluids for this object, and domain tells the add-on that we want all the fluid to be inside this, and it's clever, it knows that you wanna see inside the domain, so it sets the viewport display for you. It's also giving us this handy reminder to save, which is a very important thing, especially with any physics in Blender. So we're gonna save the scene now. Now we're gonna leave the Flip Fluids add-on for the time being while we make the scene that it's gonna interact with. So first off, press Shift A to add a new object, which is gonna be an icosphere. And here on the bottom left, I'm gonna increase the number of subdivisions I think three is fine. And we're gonna press one on the number pad and grab this with G into this corner of the scene. I think it's slightly too big. So in edit mode, I'm gonna scale it down just a little bit. So 0.8, I'm gonna grab it up a little bit. And as I'm grabbing, I'm pressing control. So it snaps to the grid. I had to zoom in a little bit, so we snap to the fine grid, not to the big grid. And I think placing it here is gonna be absolutely fine. Next, we're gonna make some cylinders that the water is gonna interact with. So let's press Shift A, add a mesh, a cylinder. In edit mode, we're gonna scale this in the Z axis twice, should be enough. And let's grab it down here. I think it's too wide, so we'll go back into edit mode. S, shift Z to scale it, but lock the Z axis. This makes it skinnier. And I think about 0.7 is good. 
Now we're going to have a bunch of these, so let's move it off to the side. And we're just going to bevel it a little bit so it doesn't look so harsh, so it looks more natural. So we're going to go into the Modifiers tab, add a modifier, and select Bevel. And you can see it adds a nice little bevel at the top. And we're going to increase the number of segments to make it a little more smooth. I think four looks good here. And we're going to right click and shade auto smooth. And it's going to give it some nice smooth shading. Now this is ready to duplicate, but I'm going to save my scene with control S before I do that. So let's go into top view with seven and we'll duplicate this to make a few of them. And actually, before we make too many, let's give them a material. We're not going to play around with the material yet. This just saves us having to go through and select every object and give it the material later on. So I'm going to call this obstacle material. And I'm going to give this object the same obstacle material. And now when we keep duplicating with Shift D, it already has the material set up for you. So I think this placement is good. Maybe one more here. And we're going to give these a nice little bit of randomness by rotating them. So we're going to press R and R again. And this lets us pivot it around like this. So we're going to give each obstacle a tiny little bit of random rotation just to make things a bit more interesting. I think this is good. There's no right answers here. Tweak this to your liking. Now I'm going to go to front view and I was going to raise or lower them, but actually this is a very good level. There's no need to raise them or to lower them. I'm going to move them a little bit to the right though. And I'm going to move this a bit more to the right to give it some more room. And we're going to make an outflow over here, which is going to suck up warm fluid. So we'll press Shift A, add a cube. Let's move it to the corner here. And if we go into edit mode, we can scale it in the Y axis 3. Because if you'll remember, we scaled the big cube by three times in every axis. And this is maybe too big. So let's go into front view, let's go into edit mode. Let's press Alt Z to go into X-ray so we can see all the way through. And we'll make this whole cube smaller. So select these, grab them in the X axis, and select these and grab them in the Z axis. And the reason I'm not scaling is I wanna keep it in the corner. So that's a nice easy way to do that. And now all of our objects are ready to go and we can add the flip fluid settings. So let's do this one by one for every object as we added it into the scene. And we'll press Alt Z again to disable X-ray. And now things are a bit more solid. We can see them a bit more easily. So let's start with this icosphere. Go into the physics properties. Again, enable flip fluids. This is going to tell Blender that we want to use the add-on for this object. And we're going to make it an inflow. Now, inflow means that it's going to add fluid to the scene. And remember when we made the domain a domain and flip fluids told Blender to make it wireframe? Well, it does the same thing again. And it's also very handily disabled it in rendering. So when we render, we're not going to see this sphere. We only want to see the water that comes out of it. Now, let's set the same settings for all of these objects. So for each one of these, we're going to make it an obstacle. So select each of these cylinders, enable flip fluids and make them an obstacle. And I've made the final one an obstacle there. And we're going to select this outflow that's going to make the water disappear. And we're going to select flip fluids, type outflow. And outflow means that it's going to suck up water. So when water touches it, it's going to disappear. And let's quickly walk through all of these settings because some of them we haven't used. So none means you're not going to use flip fluids for this object. 
domain, like we've said, holds all of your fluid. Fluid, now this is different from inflow. If you select an object as a fluid, it's going to create some fluid in that object, which is going to drop down, but it's not going to keep making fluid. So fluid is like one object made of water that splashes down, whereas an inflow is like a tap. It constantly adds water. And this object, we want it to constantly add water to the scene. Obstacle we've covered. There are any obstacles that the water bounces off of, but they're not water themselves. Inflow we've talked about, outflow we've talked about, and force fields are advanced, but they're a way of influencing your water. So you can get it to follow paths, you can push and pull it, but we're not going to be using it in this tutorial because it's a little bit advanced. Now, actually, the settings for inflows and obstacles are really great by default. There's very little here that we have to change. I will show you one cool trick, though, which is that I want a nice long animation, let's say 800 frames, but I don't want to make fluid for all 800 frames. Let's say I want to stop making fluid around frame number 600. I'm going to go to frame 600. I'm going to hover the mouse here, and I'm going to press I. Now this adds a keyframe. I'm going to go forward one frame and disable this and again press I. And now the tap or the inflow is going to stop making fluid around frame 600. We will quickly talk through these settings though in case you need to use them for your project. So the sub steps is only if your inflow is moving very quickly and you want it to create fluid in between frames. Um, even when I have moving inflows, I don't need to change this, so I would leave that alone. I would also ignore priority level for the vast majority of uh, situations. Now, this box, inflow velocity, allows you to spawn water which is flowing in a specific direction. So you can have water coming out instead of falling straight down. I'm not going to use it here, but if you do want to use it and you're not sure which direction, then just rotate your scene a little bit. And this little gizmo in the top right will give you all the axes. So let's say I wanted the water to flow right to left, so in this direction. So directly towards the obstacles and towards the outflow. Well, I can see this is in the negative x-axis because it's this direction, but it's away from uh, the x label. So I would look at this. This is the x and I would make this a negative number but we're not going to have any initial velocity today. Add object velocity means that if your object, so if your tap is moving, then that movement is added to the fluid. Again, we're not going to use it. And we're also going to ignore constrained fluid velocity. Again, these geometry attributes are kind of advanced. We're not going to touch them today. They're really handy if you want to have colored fluids. So this is an amazing feature of the add-on which you can't do with the default Blender Fluid Simulation, which is having mixing fluids. Um, but we're not going to cover that today because it is advanced. This final box, Mesh Data Export, can be handy. So if you have a moving inflow, in theory, you shouldn't need to click this. So if you hover over it, it'll, it'll say you rarely need to do it. But actually, I found that you do need to tick this if you have a moving inflow or any moving objects in the scene. So if you ever have a moving object, so I have a simulation of a swimmer swimming inside some fluid, it was behaving really strangely. The water wasn't being pushed around with the movement. Uh, in that case, I had to enable this. Again, if you have a moving tap, a moving inflow, and the water isn't moving, then uh, tick this as well. Let's have a quick look at the obstacle settings. So enabled just tells you whether it's uh, working or not. So if you uncheck this, things are not going to interact with the obstacle. Inverse is if you want fluid to be inside the obstacle. We're going to leave it alone because it's normal. It's not holding fluid. It's going to bounce fluid off the outside of it. These obstacle properties, I would leave most of these alone except for friction. If you want things to be a bit more realistic, you could increase this friction, but we're going to leave it at zero because I think that's fine for this scene. And again, export animated mesh 
Use this if your mesh moves and you're having weird problems. The final object is the outflow, and these settings are gonna, are gonna look more and more familiar. So enabled just tells you whether it works or not. And we're gonna leave all the settings as default. Now we can get to the domain settings, and these are the really interesting ones, I think. So we select the domain, make sure you're in the physics uh, tab, and scroll down a little bit. I'm gonna save my scene again. And while we talk about the settings, I'm gonna click bake so that it's running in the background. And this is one of the really nice things about the add-on is that you can simulate some fluid in the background. It doesn't interrupt Blender, so it's still responsive. And you can even go around and change settings within the Flip Fluids add-on while it's simulating. So let's do that now. More bake settings we can ignore. Domain simulation grid, this is one of the most important settings. This sets the resolution of your simulation. So as we're just starting off, the default is fine. But before we render this, we're going to increase this and render it for a longer period of time. So just bear that in mind. We're going to keep the simulation method as flip. We're going to keep the world scale. We're going to keep the frame rate. And that's it for this first tab. Now, there's a lot of information here. It might look overwhelming, but we're going to talk through every single one. And especially, I'm going to tell you which ones you need to pay attention to, because most of them you don't. Most of them you can ignore. So Fluid Cache just tells it where it's going to save your simulation. Most people can ignore this. The only reason I have to delve in here is if, if I have this scene, and I want to copy and paste the file, and I want to make a new simulation based off of the old one. If you do that, this isn't going to change, and the two simulations might clash with each other. So if you're copying your file, like the situation I described, there's going to be another box here that's called um, match file name or something like that. Clicking that will rename this cache automatically to the new file name. Also, if you ever have any weird bugs, it can help to clear. This will delete everything in your cache. And you also might find it useful to see how much space is being taken up. So this is using 66 megabytes so far. But actually, in 9 out of 10 situations, you don't have to look into this fluid cache. Next, these fluid display settings. Again, you can ignore these unless it's, a, it's an issue for you. The main reason you go into here is if your simulation resolution is so high that Blender can't uh, show it in real time and be responsive. In that case, you might want to reduce this surface viewport to preview. So this will show you a slightly lower resolution in your preview. But when you render it, it'll go to full resolution. But to be honest, I keep this at final most of the time. Flip fluid surface is where things start to get interesting. Now the surface mesh, I'm gonna keep as default. Meshing volume, I'm gonna keep as default. This we can keep as default. So meshing against boundary, meshing against obstacles, we're also gonna leave as default. But then we get to some interesting settings. So velocity-based attributes. If you want to use motion blur, so you want the water to be a bit blurry as it moves around, you want to tick velocity attribute but you can keep all the others unchecked actually. So speed, vorticity, I don't even know what this one is. Generate against obstacles, you can leave those. Just velocity attribute. And the only other thing you need to do to set up motion blur is press N to get this toolbar. Go into the flip fluid tab and scroll down a little bit. And you can see these geometry node tools. We're going to click this to initialize motion blur. And this should be all you need. So once we stop the simulation and run the simulation again, we should have motion blur in the scene. So we're not going to use vorticity, but you could use this if you wanted to have different colors for particularly turbulent areas of your scene. Because we're going to be using white water a bit later on, we're already going to be able to see the turbulent parts of the water, so we're not going to use this. If you want to use colors and have colors mixing with each other, that's what this next section is for. I'm not going to cover this in this tutorial, 
Let me know if you'd like a separate tutorial on color mixing because it's involved, it's its own thing. What I'll say about color though is I highly recommend the Mixbox uh, mixing mode. RGB doesn't look very good, but Mixbox is much better. It requires a bit more setup, but that more setup is worth it. Now these other attributes you can use if you want like the water to change color as it flows through your scene. Uh, again, we're not going to use that today. So that's everything for the fluid surface settings. We can collapse this back down. Next, we get to flip fluid white water. So all we're going to do here is tick enable white water simulation, and we're going to leave all these settings as default. There's one setting which you might have to change for flip fluids white water. But let me show that to you now. So that we can see it, we have to stop the simulation and start it again. So we're going to reset. This might take a second. We're going to save our scene so it doesn't break. And we're going to start the bake again. And we're going to go back down to this white water so we can look at the, there's one white water setting that you need to change in my experience. Let's scroll down in our outliner and you can see this new collection has been made called Flip Meshes, Flip Meshes. And this is made automatically by the Flip Fluids add-on. So if we select Fluid Surface, you might not think there's anything here, but if we go back to the first frame, you can see that there's now some fluid in the scene and we can press spacebar to play the animation. It's gonna be slow because it's very busy working on the simulation in the background. But this is just to give you an idea of what the fluid is going to look like. And you can see these particles just on the edge of the fluid. So you can see these black little points where the fluid is coming out. And if you select these next few objects, you can see that some of them are these particles. And in my experience, there's only one setting that you need to change with regards to the white water, and that's the particle scale. So if we select uh, one of these, we stay in the physics uh, properties tab, and we scroll down a little bit. So in my experience, most of this you can ignore, but if you think the, there are too many particles, or it looks like there's too much particles, or the particles look too big to you, you can reduce this number. So this is the particle scale. So if there's too many particles, or it looks like there's too many, you can reduce this. If they're too subtle, like you can hardly see them, you can make this bigger. But in my experience, if this has to be changed at all, it's too high and it has to be brought down. And I would bring this down by, an, by a factor of two. So if it looks too big, I would half it. So 0 0.008 becomes 0 0.004. If it's too big again, half it again until it looks about right. And I would do this for all of these. But if I'm being perfectly honest, the default settings most of the time are absolutely fine. So that was it for the white water settings. Let's have a look at the flip fluid world. So this has some really interesting settings which we'll talk about, but we're not going to change them today. So viscosity tells you how thick the fluid is. So if you want this to be not a water, but you want this to be like honey or a very thick goo, then you would enable viscosity by ticking this and playing around with the number. Now I'll show you something here that's a bit unintuitive. So my advice is to only change the base and ignore the exponent and the solve accuracy. Because if you change this, then actually it does some maths under the hood and it keeps things the same because this thing stays at five. So if you want to increase the thickness, I would increase this. So make it 10. If you want it to be subtle, you can decrease this to say 0 0.5. And my advice when changing uh, these settings, they can have a wide range. Like this viscosity can go from zero to like 50 or more. I would advise doing it in like factors of two, like we did before. So if uh, five wasn't thick enough, so five is the default. If it wasn't thick enough, I would double it to 10. And then if it doesn't work, double it again, double it again. If it's too thick, half it and half it and half it until you're happy.
and that applies to all uh, settings, especially settings that can have a really wide range. So that's viscosity, but we're not going to use it today, so we'll uncheck it. Okay, now surface tension gives a very distinctive effect, but it's hard to describe. It makes things look gloopy without looking thick. Now, if you're not sure what I mean, search YouTube for Blender Flip Fluids High Surface Tension. There's a video by the channel Pavel Blend that shows you what it looks like with very high surface tension. There's also a great video by Yossi Cohen that does a comparison. So he shows you what different levels of surface tension look like. So I would enable this if you want things to look uh, thicker, if you want the surface of the water to kind of hold it together. You can think of it as making like bigger droplets instead of lots of small droplets. But today we're going for something very much like water, so we're not going to enable it. But the advice I gave earlier applies here. So if you want it to be stronger or less strong, play with the base only, change it in powers of two, and don't change the exponent unless you absolutely have to, because it does some maths under the hood. This number is the real number that's going to be used. So if you keep this at default, you can change the base, and that controls the actual surface tension used in the simulation. Sheeting effects can look really cool. So if you have, let's say, a drop of water making a big splash, without sheeting, it might make lots of small particles everywhere. But if you enable sheeting, it'll kind of fill in a sheet. So instead of making lots of tiny droplets, it'll make a big sheet of water. I'm going to keep this disabled because it's not realistic. It adds water to the scene, which isn't really meant to be there. And also, it's not going to make this particular scene look any better. Now friction, this controls friction at the boundary of the domain. If you want some friction between the fluid and the domain, so the bottom and the sides, you can increase this, but I'm gonna keep it. And if you collapse this obstacle friction, this controls friction with each obstacle. You can also control this within the object itself. So if you select the object, there's friction here, uh, but this is a handy way to control friction for all objects at the same time. So if you want to increase friction, you can hold down and set everything to one if you wanted. But I'm going to keep it at zero. I want, to, I want things to be slippery and smooth. So that's it for Flip Fluid World. Next, we get on to Flip Fluid's materials. And this is one of the really great advantages of this add-on. So you don't have to spend a long time making a material for the surface that looks like water, making a foam material, all of this stuff is done for you. So we're gonna click into each one of these and select a material that's ready for us to use. So for the surface, this is the water itself, I'm gonna select FF Water Ocean 1. I like the way this looks. For foam, we are just gonna select FF Foam. For bubble, we're gonna select bubble. For spray, we're gonna select spray and dust. I don't think there's dust in the scene. I'm not sure what dust is. We're going to leave it. There's no default dust material, so we can leave that. Next up are the Flip Fluid Advanced Settings. Now, these really are advanced. In 99% of cases, I would leave these alone. If you want the simulation to be more accurate, you can increase this maximum number of subsets. And this safety factor also plays a role in uh, the simulation accuracy. So if you read the documentation, sometimes there are these issues of growing or shrinking fluids, and they advise making things more accurate to fix that. Actually, in my experience, when I've had uh, expanding fluid, this hasn't helped. This has only slowed down the animation. So I would really advise you to leave these alone. I would also advise you to leave this alone and this. Multi-threading, by default, will use all of your threads. So I have a six core processor with 12 threads. Another of the really nice things about Flip Fluids is that it's quite gentle on your system. So even if it's simulating using all 12 threads, you can use your computer for other tasks in the background. But if you find that your computer becomes unresponsive while it's simulating, so you want this to run in the background while you browse the internet. You can select fixed and reduce this to something like half of your total thread count. I wouldn't go lower than this. 
this should be enough to allow you to do your own stuff in the background but we're going to keep it as auto detect for now now the last two debug and stats we're definitely going to leave so um, these are just kind of interesting things that tell you where it's spending its time you know what's taking up space actually i lied we might do we might need this fluid debug because if you enable this, you can see the grid, and this can be quite handy. Because I, I got a lot of comments on my beautiful water feature tutorial saying that fluid isn't being created. And I suspect if you have a really low resolution and your inflow was smaller than one of these cubes, then you might have no material being made at all because the inflow isn't being registered on this grid. So if you find that no fluid is being made, just enable this and make sure your inflow is bigger than this resolution. But I will leave the other debugging settings and I'm going to disable this uh, now. Okay, let's save our scene and let's see what this looks like. Go back to the first frame and press space to play the animation. So it seems to be looping. Why is it looping? Oh, I made the last frame of the animation 10 because I was debugging something. Let's make it 800 again. And I think this is going to look fine. So what we'll do is reset. And we're going to increase the resolution. So actually, you can increase the resolution without resetting the bake which is kind of mind blowing. What it'll do under the hood is upsample the earlier frames to the full resolution. So you can have low resolution for the beginning, higher resolution later on. I can imagine some situations where that might actually be handy, but I haven't found it a, an excuse to use that yet. To keep things simple today, you can reset the simulation and uh, double this. So this is one more than 64. We'll, we'll do one more than 128, which is double 64. Hope that makes sense. We're going to save again, and we're going to bake. And while this bakes in the background, we're going to make some nice materials for the obstacles. That's the only material we need to make um, that's not made for us within Flip Fluids. And what's really cool is you can see the estimated time remaining. You don't have this with the other simulation systems in Blender. I will warn you about this. This seems to get slower the more fluid you have in the scene, and that makes sense. But if you have an inflow, you're always adding water to the scene. So as you add water to the scene, this will slow down, and you can see that already. So it was 16, it's so now 17 minutes. I think, yep, yeah, it's 18 minutes now. But once the scene is full of fluid, so once we have fluid all the way to the outflow, the amount of fluid should stay stable. So once we get to that stage, I would start to uh, trust the estimated time remaining number. And I'll also give a note on resolution. So we've raised our resolution from 64 to 128 plus one. And I think this will give you a big improvement in the resolution. If you wanted to double the resolution again to 256, it would only make it a little bit better, but it would take much, much longer to simulate. So my recommendation for the resolution, try to do 128 at least, but if you can't do any more, don't feel bad. Do um, 128 and that's fine. If you don't have the patience or the hardware for 128, uh, just set it to the highest number that you can tolerate. If you do have good hardware, I would recommend something in the mid 100s. So like 160, 192 is like the upper limit of where I'd go. But I've found, at least for myself, over 192, it gets much, much slower. And it's, it's barely noticeable, the difference. So while this is simulating, let's make a roughened kind of dirty metal material for the obstacles and we'll make some nice studio lighting for the scene as well. Let's go into shading. In the render properties we'll make sure we have cycles and if you have a GPU make sure you're using the GPU for cycles. 
I'm not sure if my GPU can handle OBS screen recording and rendering, so we'll only render like when we absolutely have to. We'll do most of the setup first. We'll press Shift A to add a light. This is going to be an area light, and we'll grab it in the Z axis, about six, so it's above our scene. We'll go to the light properties. We'll make it brighter, about two, uh, 300 is fine too. And we'll make it four meters. You can see it's bigger. And we're also going to add a, a platform, which the domain is going to sit on. And this is going to reflect the light. It'll make things brighter and it'll give us some context for the scene. It'll make more sense with the platform there. So we'll press Shift A to add a mesh, which is a cube. We'll go front view. We'll grab this down to about here. We'll go into edit mode. Now we'll scale this three times in every axis. This way the width matches, but we're gonna scale it down in the Z axis. So S, Z, and we're gonna scale it down. Uh, we're gonna scale it all the way to 0 0.1. This is fine. Now we grab this up, zoom in a little bit so we can snap it to the grid, and that's perfect. Now in edit mode, We'll scale it in the x-axis two times, should be perfect. And actually the material here doesn't have to be very fancy at all. We'll just call this white platform and we'll make sure it's pure white. So we'll turn this value up to one, but we can leave everything else as is. The obstacle material is gonna be a little bit interesting. So let's, let's turn up metallic all the way and then we're going to play with some nodes to give it an interesting roughness. So you can see at the moment, it looks quite rough all over the place. We can re reduce roughness and it makes it shinier. We can increase it and it looks more matte. And we're going to drive this with a texture to give it some more character. So let's press Shift A, click search. I'm going to search for a noise texture. We're going to, again, search for a color ramp. We're going to connect the noise texture to the color ramp and the color ramp to the roughness. Now, make sure you have Node Wrangler enabled. If you don't, go to Edit, Preferences. Search your add-ons for Node Wrangler. It's built into Blender. You don't have to download it and tick Node Wrangler. And once you have Node Wrangler enabled, select this noise texture and press Control T. And this gives us these nice mapping nodes, which we can move off to the side. And you can see this roughness is now being driven by this texture. So we don't want this to be very fancy at all. Black is going to be low roughness, so more shininess. And I want more shininess, so I want more black. And this white, I think it's too uh, high roughness. So even where it's more rough, I don't want it to be very rough. So that's maybe too subtle. So I want something like this. And we'll play with these settings very basically. So detail usually looks better when it's high. Let's have a look at this roughness setting. What does that do? So it seems to make things like splotchier or more spread out. Let's increase it a little bit. It looks a bit more natural. And now let's save the scene and look at things in cycles so we can finalize the materials. I've pressed zero to go into the camera view. I'll press shift F to move the camera. I think I've set that up actually. So if shift F doesn't do that for you, go to view, navigation, right click on walk navigation, assign it a shortcut or change shortcut for me because I've put it already and press shift F. So now I can press shift F and use the WASD keys to move the camera. I'm going to move it to a nice spot over here. I'm going to press right to go forward a few frames so we can see more water inside the scene. 
Okay, I think this is great. We're going to press Control B and draw a box around here so that it doesn't waste render power rendering outside the area. Now we can press, actually, let's save before we do any rendering. And we'll press Z and R to change the render mode into rendered. Okay, cool. So the background is too bright. I want this to look more contrasty. So I'm going to take the strength of the background off completely. But now it's too dark. So let's turn up the lighting. We're going to find our area lamp. Oh, it's put it inside these flip meshes for some reason. So I'm just going to move it out. And the same for this platform. So we have a lot of cubes and things. Let's make this. Let's give it a name platform so we see it, so we know what it is. And we need to make this brighter. So the area, let's go into the light properties. And let's just make this a thousand. It's maybe a bit too harsh as well. So let's make it even bigger. Let's make it eight, which is bigger. And this looks nice. I think this is ready to go. I'm just going to adjust the camera a little bit. Recently, I really liked wide angle cameras. So instead of moving the camera away, I'm going to make it wider angle. So let's try 35. Yeah. And you might notice that you don't see your white water particles here. That's not a problem. They won't show here, but they will show when you hit render. That's a feature, not a bug. Now, you might think that you have to enable motion blur, but actually it's enabled for you when you click initialize motion blur. So I'm probably going to reduce this. I think 128 is fine. And I think everything else is just kind of your personal choice. I'm going to make output a folder next to my project folder. So I'm going to call this render. I'll call this take one. And I'm going to save JPEGs instead of PNGs because they take way too much space otherwise. Normally, I would increase the resolution to 200%, but my screen recording is only 1080p. I don't think that's going to matter for this uh, scenario. Okay, one thing which I remembered straight away is you might notice this warning. It says that if you're using motion blur, Blender might crash when you render, and that's true. But the way to get around that is very simple. Press N to get this toolbar. Go into the Flip Fluids tab and scroll down. And here you can click Launch Render. You have to save the file first, and then click Launch Render, and it will automatically render from the command line for you, and it should fix this. So if you're having any weird bugs with motion blur, like it's too blurry, or Blender just crashes, make sure you render from the command line by clicking this. Now, sometimes I have to change little tweaks after I've stopped recording the video. If that happens, I'll put them on screen here and I'll put them in the description below as well. And I'll also have a pinned comment answering any frequently asked questions. So let me know any questions you have down below. So I think this scene is ready to go. What I'm going to do is, while I'm having dinner, I'm going to let this finish simulating. I'm going to render it out so you can see it at the beginning of the video, and I'll show it again now. I really hope you've enjoyed this and found it useful. Let me know in the comments what you think of this kind of tutorial, where we focus on a specific scene, but we also talk about all the other settings and talk about all the other things that you might have to change. Like I said in the beginning, if you support me on Patreon, thank you so much. You can download this for just $3. Make sure you like the video if you found it helpful. Subscribe for more Blender tutorials, and I'll see you soon. Take care.